I was up on scaffolding in Europe, you know, two feet from the wall, you cannot imagine that your little paint strokes are going to be anything. This is Beth Reese. So I don't think many people get that experience of, you know, like Michelangelo. But then you would climb down. It's like, what? I'm Kate Tucker, and this is Hope Is My Middle Name, a podcast from Consensus Digital Media. Today, we get to talk with Beth Reese and her husband, Tim, two farmers with a passion for restoring old buildings in Cape and Bridge, West Virginia. This is a town of no more than 400 people, and I got to visit there last year while filming for Made in America, and I totally fell in love with the place. While I was there, Tim and Beth sent me to the Farmer's Daughter, which is a market that has a legit town butcher set up in an old Tasty Freeze that Tim had renovated. At the Farmer's Daughter, I had the best burger of my life. I haven't gotten over it, and you'll hear more about that later. But for now, Beth and Tim are here to talk about why small towns matter and how working together as a community to restore an old building or even just paint a mural on it is sometimes all we need to reconnect with our roots or to set down new ones, ultimately to find a place of belonging and a place of hope. So Tim and Beth, it's so good to get to talk with you again. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Kate. Good to see you again. Thanks for having us. Let's start by going back to your roots. So Tim, tell me where you grew up. Well, I was born in West Virginia and was here as a small child. And then my dad got a job in the big city, and he went to Washington, and we moved there, and then he lost his job, and we came back to West Virginia and moved to Charleston. I moved five times, but that's not a unique thing for people from West Virginia. They're always moving in and out, and that just seems to be part of the culture. Beth, how about you? I was born in Washington, D.C., When I was five years old, we moved out to the new suburbs, which I realize now was horse country. So I keep thinking I came from a developed suburbs, but I lived in the woods. And I think that's the part of me that responded when we came out here to a river and the woods. This is the first place I've ever felt truly like it was home. Mm. My parents both families, both sides, came over from Scotland and Italy and ended up in West Virginia settling there first before they went anywhere in the United States. And some of them, a lot of them are still there. And so for me, when I get to go back, it's just this like, you know, there's this mystery and you drive through the mountains and there's, I mean, there's literally mist everywhere. And it's just, the mist itself just makes you feel like you're going into this like otherworldly kind of older place in in Appalachia. And so for me, when I got to go to Cape and Bridge, it really felt a little bit like home too, even though I had never been there. And I'm curious, you know, for Tim, being from West Virginia, when you come back, what is it that is so unique or so special about that state? Well, I think West Virginia, because it's been isolated for a long time, bad roads, uh, industry, uh, it's kind of a mono industry here, and not a lot of in-migration. I think it has developed a sense of itself as a unique place. I think it's developed its own culture and social fabric here that is really interconnected. And I heard one time that Only two states have this kind of real sense of identity. One is Texas and West Virginia, you know, just have a real bonding sense. And I think the other thing is West Virginians have left the state and they long to get home. So that emotional draw really imprints on West Virginians and makes it a super special place. Mm, I feel it. Could you describe for folks who've never been to Cape and Bridge what you see when you're driving into town? Well, first thing you'll see is a big mural that we worked on, which is a welcome to Cape and Bridge. But you'll see a a small community populated by a little less than 400 people, a lot of local businesses, iconic green bridge that crosses the Cape and River. And the bridge itself, what's it like? 
okay, here we go to get in my developer nerd way. It's a Parker <laughs> through truss bridge, which was built uh, out of Wheeling Steel, West Virginia Steel, by a uh, bridge builder that was, I think, from Clarksburg. This latest variation was put up in 1932, and we're going through a whole renovation of that bridge since it's such an iconic structure. You can't have a town called Cape and Bridge without a without a good looking bridge, right? <laughs> so that's what our next exciting project is civically in town. So you're coming at these projects with a contractor's mind. Right. I was in the building and real estate industry. I started out as a general contractor in a commercial contracting firm, took a, a brief stint in politics, and then realized you can't raise a family at the whims of the voters and got into a honest living uh, of contracting. And then that kind of morphed into doing work as a, as a broker, helping people find properties, and then finally as a developer myself. Where do you think your interest in building things came from? I don't know. I was a scout, you know, get a merit badge for everything you do. And <laughs> so I got kind of trained that way. And, and I just like projects. I, I'm not really a process guy. I just like a start, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're in building or development, there's those three phases. And then the next phase begins, right? The inhabiting of these spaces, which... Beth, you're really good at facilitating. So I wonder, what is it that has motivated you to build community and create the spaces for people to come together? My friend, she goes, you're a weaver. And I absolutely love that. It warms my heart. The idea of sort of a blank slate and then weaving together people and places. And then you sit back and the magic happens. It might also be like a gardener. I've always loved gardening. And you plant seeds, but you really don't know what the synergy is going to be like. So there's something much bigger than the parts. Um, so I've always loved that part about building community. Well, your love for it is evident in the spaces themselves. So I'm curious how you both came to be involved in the effort to revitalize Cape and Bridge. So Tim's really, really good at getting to know people's backgrounds when he talks to them. And so we got to know people's roots really quickly. And that helped us feel a part of, even though we weren't many generations uh, in, we knew the people who were. We knew the leaders. And it's such a sweet little town, and we can't help ourselves. We like to build, and we like to, I never want to say improve. The town doesn't need to be improved, but refreshed. Mm -hmm. I've always worked with kids. I was an elementary school teacher, and then I was an outdoor educator, creating outdoor classrooms around schools. And oh my goodness, when kids see the product of their work, especially with community members, and they can go back and visit it. You know, I planted that tree. I painted that mural. That's where I floated the boats that we made in that race as you know, you all are so focused on, they have such hope. And I think our deepest longing as humans is to belong. So all we needed was a taste of that. And for people to say, this is great. You know, we were newbies and sometimes newbies takes a while for people to accept you, but here we were contributing immediately and their kids were so involved that, um, we all were very passionate about doing more together. And I think you get to know people quickly when you're building things together. Let's talk about some of those things that you've been building together. What are some of the projects you've been involved in locally? Well, uh, when we moved back to West Virginia, the first thing we worked on was our farm, improving our soils, our livestock, our gardens. That really was the key and the foundational piece we wanted to do something in town at a certain point, I guess six or seven years in. You know, real estate's an addiction, and there was a, a building in town that 
was vacant and had been on the market forever. And uh, my son-in-law is a butcher, and he was looking for a butcher shop down in Asheville, North Carolina. And we saw this building, and we just posed the question, you know, would you think about a butcher shop here in Cape and Bridge? Because if you would, you know, this might be a good project for us to work on. And the reason we like the butcher concept or market concept is we're an agricultural community, but you couldn't buy any uh, fresh meat or fresh produce or fresh anything in town. So I, I thought there was a market niche there. And uh, Pete Pacelli, uh, the farmer's daughter, and my uh, daughter, Kate Pacelli, said, yeah, sure, we'll come uh, to Cape and Bridge. And, you know, they've created a business that is regionally known been voted the best hamburger in West Virginia because uh, they put so much love and care in it. It might be the best hamburger this side of the Mississippi. I have to say, I've had that burger. <laughs> it's, I still think about it. You know, when we came and visited you, everybody on that crew still talks about that burger. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame, too, because I never order a burger when I go out anyplace else. <laughs> Because I'm always comparing it to the farmer's daughter burger. And there's no going back from that. I know. So we roll into town. First stop, farmer's daughter. How long does it take to drive through Cape and Bridge? Uh, if you go the speed limit, which you better do because uh, <laughs> <laughs> they ticket, uh, you know, maybe two, three minutes, two minutes, something like that. It's pretty small. Yeah. It's such a beautiful route, and you would definitely not expect to find such an amazing, well-stocked store along this winding country road. It's a total oasis, and you're otherwise potentially in a food desert, right? So I heard someone say that people used to drive 20 minutes just to get an onion in Cape and Bridge. So we have these food deserts across America. There's this whole aspect of identifying these old buildings as potential places to restore not only community and gathering and places that where you can find the best burger, but also answering these deeper systemic problems around a community's ability to survive, right? And to get fresh produce and find a consistent food source. So Beth, I'd love to hear about one of the projects closest to your heart. I'm intimately tied to the River House, which was the second project. Tell me more about the River House. So the River House is a nonprofit, and that's the only nonprofit that has uh, blossomed in one of these buildings. But this building was renovated by the whole community. That was unique. The dream was there from these this young couple, Joanna Murray and Mike Everson, who are mu musicians and artists who were teachers in the community, and Tim's vision of what it could do as a community space. And then we allowed people to come in and literally with their own hands turn it into what I feel like is our first community art piece. When you stand in it, you're in the middle of a community-built, beautiful art space. You can feel that when you're there. There's so much love in that building. I want to talk about another project that you did. Tell me about the mural that you see when you're driving into town. The Cape and Bridge mural, that happened in the year of the cicada. So I think that was uh, 2021. And that was a project of the River House uh, supported by the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, which gave us a grant. Uh, along with uh, donations from local businesses. But that was a, a mural that was painted on the side of the Cape and Bridge or Hampshire County uh, Emergency Management Services building. It's a two-story, beautiful mural that was designed by my other daughter, Jen <laughs> Lockwood, and Michael Anderson, who's the art teacher at the middle school, and painted by the kids and volunteers from the middle school and in the community. Could you take me through the experience of painting the mural? What did it feel like to be part of that? This mural, because it was so large, I was up on scaffolding and you're up, you know, two feet from the wall. You cannot imagine that your little paint strokes are going to be anything. 
So I don't think many people get that experience of, you know, like Michelangelo. But then you would climb down. It's like, what? The design is a vintage postcard that says, welcome to Cape and Bridge. Remember those with the bold letters and the pictures inside the letters. So people were, they were verklempt. You know, they were... They were all goosebumpy when they stood back, and it's we did it, and absolutely needed a community to do it. You knew that you could not have done that alone, and I think it just captured that feeling of look what we can do together. Plus, I just love color and bringing joy and promise to people when they just look over and don't expect art. So you drive in, you may be just coming to get gas, and it knocks people over. And then there was a whole motorcycle troop that had come through and then turn around. And then they did a big group photo right in front of it. All these motorcycle guys. <laughs> it lifts the whole community or anyone who looks to their left and sees something unexpected and beautiful that obviously was made by many hands. Talk about the many hands who helped make it. So that was the third community art project in town. So the method of paint by numbers uh, that Jen used made it so available for any age, people who don't think they're artists, whatever they do looks great because there's a design ahead of time. And by that point of this mural, was it during COVID, Tim? 2021, right. Yes. So people were very isolated, as we all were. And so this opportunity to come together and do something outdoors, Mm -hmm. we had a network from the River House of families and children, and then our partnership with the schools. We had a crowd come. People were so disappointed if they didn't get to put their mark on that mural. And, And everybody knew each other. Of course, because it's just another opportunity. I think it's so important to create spaces and experiences for people to connect and reconnect and reconnect because those conversations go deeper when you're doing something together that takes a while. You talk about children and family as opposed to going to watch something, Mm -hmm. participatory activities like that. Tim, did you participate? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I painted the cardinal. I'm very proud of the cardinal that's inside the first C in Cape and Bridge. But the cool thing about uh, these big, bold block letters is the subject inside of the C, A, P, O, N, and then bridge are all themes that uh, people in town are proud of and which really talks about what Cape and Bridge is all about. There's wildlife, there's hunting, fishing, music, uh, agricultural pictures, a barn, a basket full of food. So when you look at that mural, you're looking not only at a really cool design, but you're also looking at the values that we share in Cape and Bridge. I think the powerful effect of getting people together, asking what matters to them, giving them opportunities to contribute to whatever the design is, is it serves as a mirror. I don't think people get to hear back. You know in your body and your heart what your values are, but your shared values don't get mirrored back in such a Mm. clear way. And so I think as the behind the scenes people, which is what I always want to be, it's not about me, is to listen well, Mm -hmm. to create opportunities for people to think and ponder on what matters most. I mean, that's the most important question, what matters most. Yeah. And then to find a way, a variety of ways, art, music, architecture, food, to mirror that back to them. Because it's not about bringing something new or fixing a town of integrity like this. Mm -hmm. It's about mining what's already here and what matters to people and then telling the story. So many ways to do that. And the story is always evolving. I grew up in a very small town in Northeast Ohio, and I will say that driving by old buildings that are abandoned every day, 
it weighs on you. And when you come home and somebody's actually taken the time and care and love and money to restore it, it changes the way you feel about your home. Exactly. When something has new life, it affects people on so many levels. And that was it. We didn't have a plan. And the people that we've worked with on this didn't have a plan of what the town should look like. But we did know we wanted to help breathe vitality into those things in decline. So as a town, you're building resilience by creating these spaces and opportunities for people to come together. And you're also building resilience from an energy standpoint with solar power at the River House and also on the farm at Taproot Farm. How did you decide to transition to solar? You know, I'm originally from southern West Virginia, and my grandfather w- worked in the mines. And so we, we've always produced a lot of energy here in West Virginia. This is just a new way of doing it, uh, mining West Virginia, son. When we moved back to West Virginia, that's one of the first things I did is put solar panels uh, up because I thought it was the right thing to do. And we've expanded it to our barn, uh, which handles all our agricultural electrical needs So uh, working with a dynamite regional company called Mountain View Solar, Mike McKechnie and and team, and they have a special program for nonprofits. We were able to uh, help uh, Mountain View Solar sell residential systems, and they were able to help the River House by installing a a solar array on the River House, which is really cool because I— I, I think it's somewhere around 25 or 30 percent of the electrical usage from the river house is now created on the roof of the river house. Uh, hopefully, it'll in- inspire other businesses and residential homes to install solar on it. And what about your power at Taproot Farm? How much of that is solar? Uh, the solar on our farm, it accounts for Uh, roughly about 25% of our residential usage and 100% of our agricultural usage. I have two systems. One's on the, for the house, and the other one is for our barn, our wells, our fans, and our heaters. How does that translate into dollars and cents? How much is that saving you? Well, the payback on solar is about eight years. So uh, it's a, it's kind of like buying all your electrical up front and it'll last 25 years. So do the math, 25 minus 8, 17 years of free electrical uh, production. So that, that's pretty cool. And I can tell you this, electrical rates are not going to go down. They're always going up. So not only do we save by producing our own electricity, when we're not using the electricity, it runs the meter backwards, So that also uh, is a benefit, and our neighbor can use the electricity that we're producing on Taproot. Yeah. It makes me think about the whole aspect of growth. It also includes the ability to adapt to changes that need to take place in order for growth to occur, and that can be uncomfortable. And the uncertainty of a transition like the energy transition we're looking at right now as a country across the world— We're in West Virginia, and conversations about coal are fraught with emotion. You know, it's been about putting food on the table for a long time, and I think there's a lot of push and pull around it. So, Tim, what's your perspective? Uh, Well, coal is part of West Virginia's heritage, and uh, it is an emotional issue. I know a lot of people— look at coal and they think, oh, that, that's just bad. They make this judgment on it, but coal has built West Virginia and coal has built the country. But the writing's on the wall, even here in West Virginia, even our governor who and, and senator who are heavily involved in the coal industry understand that we need to diversify. And Solar is making gains in West Virginia. Even here in Hampshire County, we have our first industrial-sized solar array. How do people in Cape and Bridge feel? I mean, not that you can speak for everyone, but when when you talk to people, what do they say about your solar and and are other people um, interested in implementing it? Yeah, I think everybody is interested in solar. They don't really understand, like, how it works and how you finance it. 
I think one thing that's really going to crack the code on solar is when the the Ford, is it called, lightning truck comes out and real guys, guys start driving that truck and electric. Uh, yeah, all electric and especially with gas prices where they are. And mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a renewed interest in solar, not only for production for, you know, the grid, but also for transportation. Let's zoom out for a minute from solar and electric and to the broader concept of sustainability. Beth, in your world, what do you think of when you hear the word sustainability? I think of the word regenerative, which is nature's way. Something that's no longer needed goes back into the cycle. And that can be resources, it can be people, it can be ideas. Even, for instance, with the River House, choosing the arts as the overarching umbrella for all that's done there and choosing participatory arts where it's it's not just about receiving something that may go on your wall and may or may not get passed along, but it's actually learning how to do something, play an instrument, cook something, woodworking, uh, doing it with young people or older people to feed into that regenerative cycle. And then also the arts is about self-expression. That may not seem like it applies and may just be in my mind that it applies to sustainability, but It's been a really hard couple of years for all of us, and especially small towns and small businesses and nonprofits with COVID and Mm. just the isolation. And so creating and nourishing ways and spaces for people to be heard and seen and to belong to each other, to me, is about sustainability. Sustainability encompassing community, economy, energy, and the environment. All of these things working together. So, Tim, for you, what does sustainability mean to you? Well, the the first idea that came across my mind is diversifying, limiting that way of thinking. There's only one way to to get from A to B. We we all know there are many paths from the start to the finish, and I think the the piece that I would bring to that question of sustainability is making sure there are many ways to get success, even if several of them or many of them fail along the way. And, um, you know, mice have large litters because a lot of them get eaten, right? But but few of them survive and breed on. So we, we got to do that with our ideas, too. Uh, uh, That's a farmer talking. Yeah. I love a good farm analogy, Tim. (laughs) Let's talk about sustainability as it applies to small towns. We hear a lot about small town America struggling, you know, struggling to keep young people, struggling to hold on to industry. But there are places like Cape and Bridge. You've got under 400 people, but you're growing, you're thriving. You've got young people moving in, small businesses opening up. You've got new festivals and public art. In your experience, Why do small towns matter, especially to a state like West Virginia that has such a strong sense of identity? Well, I think small towns matter because they exist already. The building stock is there, and the scale allows people to have individual impact. If you're in a city, it really takes a lot of capital and a lot of people to make change happen. In a small town, it can take an individual with energy and with support from either a debt or an equity investor, and you can make substantial change. There, there really isn't need to rebuild what is already here. We have buildings, they're just unoccupied. We have space for people to live, but we just haven't created the economy or the attraction to bring those people here. It's not all about keeping your people here. It's also about attracting people. You know, we have West Virginians by birth and we have West Virginians by choice. And both of those are 
critical elements to the future. Small towns are desperate for industrious people to come in and develop new ideas that honor the heritage and the the assets that are already there. So, yay, small towns. <laughs> I think Tim made a very important point at the end of that. Growth is always exciting, but there is a fine line of growing for the sake of growth or growing because you think your idea is better than what exists, which is not what we're interested in, or growing just as a form of vitality, um, breathing life into soil, into buildings. We are hardwired to do that. And so I think that sensitivity, if someone is moving into an area, the sensitivity of listening and finding out what matters and who is here and what has already been done to the soil, both literally and figuratively, before us. This idea of I'm going to fix something doesn't last. And Tim, being a, a native to West Virginia, has explained to me with great empathy and compassion that people always say, oh, small towns are so resistant to change or improvement. Well, particularly in West Virginia, West Virginia has seen so many people and businesses come through and take uh, coal, natural resources, and then leave. And so they've heard a lot of people with a lot of grand ideas. So I think each of these projects that we've witnessed and been a part of, all of them had local leaders involved. Uh, and now a lot of those leaders say, hey, you know what we can do? How can we make this happen? But you, you need a stamp of approval by those who have been here through the hard times. That's part of why I think some of these things look to me like they're going to last. Speaking of things that last, what is the legacy for Cape and Bridge? What do you hope to see in the future? Well, I don't know. How's that for a great answer? I don't know what the future will lead. But I, I do feel that uh, and the reason, you know, we're always interested in talking about this is to hopefully inspire some other communities and some other young and maybe not so young leaders to step up. I will give a shout out to our local bank, FNB Bank. You know, you need to have local banks that support these ideas. And there are a lot of local banks that are looking for good ideas and good leaders. So the future for Cape and Bridge is to try to replicate some of these methods in other towns that need some healthy growth. I hope it plants a seed of, of intrigue in uh, other communities uh, in Appalachia and you know, across the country. Oh, it is already. Trust me. <laughs> Beth, what do you think? <laughs> Community health. That's not something I had really thought about a lot in my past life, but community and a small business are organisms. There's a health and there's a way to nourish health. So I'm most interested in being involved in that. And especially after the last couple years when mental health and physical health have been affected so much by the pandemic and fear. I won't say trust is growing because I don't know what it was like before, but in these places where people are coming together to express themselves and to stretch themselves, uh, we have open mic at this um, beautiful arts and music and community center. And so many people have said, this is the first time I've ever stepped on stage. Mm. I'm not as interested in, although I'd love it, having, you know, uh, lots of new musicians, but that someone feels safe enough mm. to step up there and not other places in front of this audience because they know they will be honored for who they are and what they contribute. To me, that's a, a concrete example of what it can feel like to be in a community that intentionally, mindfully 
nourishes these conditions for people to thrive. Yes, to feel a sense of belonging. That's giving me so much hope. What's giving you hope these days? Young people, uh, we have five grandchildren under the age of seven that live within walking distance of us now. If I had thought that up and invited them, they wouldn't have come. It's happened organically because when it came time to start the next generation for, for each of our daughters, this is where they wanted to do it. If we shine the light on some of these beautiful small towns in healthy environments, this next generation, they know. They, they know what they need to thrive and they know what they care about. Mm -hmm. In this super polarized world and world of really difficult news to wake up to, I think there's hope that there are other ways to hold conversations and there are other ways to relate individually with people beyond politics or, you know, divisive things. So talking about your family, talking about music and the arts talking about growing things. These are all things that are more real than the divisive things that are set up to create high energy emotions. Those are reasons to hope. If, if we can turn the conversation away from things that are concocted to try to make us uh, divided and turn the conversation to things that are uniting you know, we can really get through anything as a, as a country and, uh, you know, in a community. It has been so good to talk with you. As always, I come away with so much hope. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope to get down to West Virginia soon. Thank you, Kate, for inviting us. It was a joy and makes me feel great about <laughs> what's going on in Cape and Bridge. So thank you for that. Yeah, Kate, it's always a pleasure, and you're welcome here at Taproot Farm anytime. Well, I can't wait. And you know I still have some of that moonshine. I need to actually ask you if I can still drink it. I'm a little scared, but... <laughs> it doesn't go bad. It's okay? Is it okay? Because it has the raspberries in it. You put it in An um, Andrea's jam jars, and I still have it in my fridge, and I think about you guys like almost every day because when I open the fridge, I see it. <laughs> it will never go bad. And if you run out of fuel, you can pour it in your car. <laughs> Solar and moonshine. That's yeah, our that's, that's our diversified <laughs> energy policy. Thanks to Tim and Beth Reese for another wonderful conversation, including those tips on how to use up that moonshine in my fridge. I sure can't wait to get back to Cape and Bridge. Hope is my middle name is hosted by me, Kate Tucker. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kate Tucker Music. If there's someone you think belongs on the show, please send me a message. This episode was produced by Christine Fennessy with editing from Audrey No and executive produced by Rachel Swaby. Our sound designer is Mark Bush. Music was by the fantastic artists at Epidemic Sound and me. Big thanks to Connor Gaughan, our publisher and fearless leader at Consensus Digital Media. Hope is my middle name can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you want to listen. It would mean so much to us if you would follow, rate, and review the show Hope is My Middle Name is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume. See you next time. <laughs>